Thank you very much, Dennis. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I've been a resident in Albany now for four years, and uh, uh, for uh, anyone in my game, anyone really in any walk of life, I can thoroughly commend the place to you. What I want to do this morning is um, talk a little bit about the opportunities for discovery and new insights that come from uh, what might be perceived as academic research that I think have direct transferability into making uh, regional development um, uh, world class in, in many ways. <clears throat> so the proposition really that excites me is, is this mixture of um, financial, political, communi community and environmental studies embraced in that word sustainability. And I want to put to you that an understanding of landscapes on which we live uh, may have profound implications for how we might live sustainably um, and set up uh, future communities going hundreds, if not thousands, of years forward. <clears throat> I want to uh, also acknowledge that Albany is one of those towns that has a significant Aboriginal presence, about 10% of the population. And uh, I'm involved in a number of programs that are walking shoulder to shoulder with Aboriginal people to try and better understand how we care for country cross-culturally. And uh, that'll be a theme in this talk. And in particular, Professor Len Collard from UWA has uh, indicated that there is a trilogy in Noongar cosmology um, that pervades fundamental thinking about how we might live healthy, happy lives. And it embraces the three uh, fundamental principles of Buddha, Mort and Cartagen, country, family and knowledge. That attitude I, I, I would commend to all of us as a way for going forward, particularly in the sort of landscapes um, which, uh, with which uh, Australia, substantial parts of Australia are, are blessed. So I just want to take you a little back in time because um, I think this is a significant starting point for understanding the world and how to manage landscapes. So this is a reconstruction of what the Earth uh, looked like 90 million years ago. The significance of that date is that's when global sea levels were at their highest on record, uh, 250 metres above present levels, except for uh, uh, Australia. Australia, at this point in time, being the flattest and lowest continent you would have thought would have been a, a series of islands, but you can see the outline of the continent is almost as we know it today, and it's believed that, um, from good scientific research, that there was a, a big block of continental plate that rafted underneath the continent and propped us up. So we were very fortunate indeed. And the comparison I want to uh, focus on here is just Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere. And what strikes me is that the Southern Hemisphere is more or less recognisable in outline uh, to what we have today. I mean, India, India as an island, uh, it's on its way to crash into Asia is uh, a bit unusual, uh, but you can recognise the outlines of uh, Southern Africa, Australia with New Guinea attached at the top, Antarctica, and South America. And the, the, the contrast with North America is fundamental. You can sort of make out the outline of the USA, if you like. Um, uh, Eurasia is a mess of islands and a huge continental landmass. Very hard to actually um, see present-day coastlines, if you like, in the Northern Hemisphere. Significance of that is that oceans have been on the coastlines of the Southern Hemisphere continents, more or less in the same position for, more than, for, for 90 million years at least and going back further. And what do oceans do? They moderate climate. Um, they, whereas the interior continents, as we know, are, can be quite severe and, and uh, snow and ice and all that is, is a common interior continental experience. But here in southwestern Australia, we've had ocean on two sides for 90 million years. And recent uh, measurements of uh, the moderating effect of, of uh, oceans um, indicate that at least for 200 to 300 kilometres going inland, that moderating influence is evident. And that, that's, I believe, had a profound impact on the evolution of plants and animals and not on humans as well and the way we live. So I want to pick up on this theme that the Northern Hemisphere isn't like the Southern Hemisphere and that Southern Hemisphere stuff has to be rethought. Um, 
there's a big challenge for us because most people on Earth live in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, most of the uh, information about planetary systems, biology, human cultures come from the Northern Hemisphere as a consequence. But I would suggest to you that people, people in the Northern Hemisphere, by and large, are living on landscapes that in many ways are profoundly different from some of the Southern Hemisphere landscapes, particularly those near um, the coastline within 300 kilometres or so. So this is relatively new stuff and uh, it's only being tested as, as I speak really. So um, you're entitled uh, entirely to be sceptical about what I present to you, but I would encourage you to at least start uh, thinking about this. Um, and it's published in a, in a paper uh, that I called Ockville Theory in 2009. So it's not, not a decade old, this body of theory. <coughs> and I want to introduce this term Ockbills. Um, I'll introduce two new terms to you. Ockbill stand is an acronym and it stands for Old, Climatically Buffered, Infertile Landscapes. The principle is the climatic buffered bit is drawing attention to these areas that have had oceanic influence for tens of millions of years. Um, the old bit relates to old geology and old landforms. Um, and the infertility comes from literally tens of millions of years of rainfall, weathering away nutrients from soils on these old landscapes, washing them down in the landscape and eventually out into the ocean. And the ultimate outcome of that is pure quartz on granite or sandstone geologies. Sand. Um, and... Uh, you're in the land of sand gropers, aren't you? So, <clears throat> the sort of places that this occurs, sorry, the, the previous slide just illustrates that what I'm talking about are uh, places on Earth, predominantly in the Southern Hemisphere, not all, not all, but predominantly. And I'll just give you three examples. The Tapuis, the famous Tapuis of Venezuela, Brazil, those flat top Conan Doyle lost world mountaintops, uh, South Africa's greater, greater uh, Cape region and southwestern Australia are examples, but we predicted that there will be these sorts of landscapes elsewhere in the southern hemisphere, and people are now looking, and um, uh, places like Sydney, the Hawkesbury sandstone country, Sydney, uh, right, up, right up the east coast wherever there's sandstone and granite, in fact. In Brazil, there's a major research thrust now on a, on a group of mountains north of um, Rio called Campo Repestri vegetation. North Queensland, and uh, a marine biologists here in UWA have recently identified that the, the coastline and marine nearshore coastline of southwestern Australia is globally unique, and they've borrowed the terminology and called it an OCBIS, Old Climatically Buffered Infertile Seascape, unique on the planet because of the Lewin Current. So it's not just about here, it's not just about Australia. And I want you to, to help you visualise what these look like. So the top photo here is an Ockbill. It's a granite outcrop in the wheat belt of Western Australia. Um, and down below is the other opposite extreme of, of landscape, which most of the earth has and most people live on. And I call them Yodfels, which is uh, another acronym standing for young, um, often disturbed and fertile landscapes. So this is a glacial valley in Wales, and it's rather significant. I've got a little image there of Charles Darwin because this is where he did his first field work as a, as a Cambridge University student before going on the Beagle uh, on the famous voyage around the world, including coming to Albany. And the, the contrast is in many ways, the fertility bit in, in particular. You'll notice the farmland in the, in the Welsh uh, valley there at the bottom of, uh, of these steep eroding slopes. This place had glaciers on it um, uh, eight to 10,000 years ago. Um, and the landscape on top, that, the summit of that mountaintop is estimated to have been a, a landscape feature in southwestern Australia when dinosaurs were the major form of large, large animal stomping around, over 100 million years old. It's dropped about a metre or two, uh, the rock itself, in terms of erosion, but the soil in this sort of landscape erodes away from that rock just at a metre depth per million years, extraordinarily slowly, uh, compared to 8,000 years of erosion since um, glaciers in Wales. So they're the two, and, and the plant I show you in the top photo is just one of many examples to highlight that the, these old landscapes are incredibly rich in rare localised endemic forms of life, plants and animals. I, I said most of the Earth's landscapes are yodfuls, and here's some photos of them just to give you a sense. Young, often disturbed and fertile. 
disturbance is really important. So windswept plains uh, with dust storms, uh, wetlands, the, the margins of rivers, the margins of lakes, the margins of the oceans are these young, regularly disturbed landscapes. Um, volcanic lands uh, get new soil uh, plastered over them. Uh, steep slopes erode, and of course, uh, glaciers just uh, are like giant grinding bulldozers that uh, grind up mineral rock and uh, release the nutrients in them. In Western Australia, if you want to recognise uh, Ockbills, the older parts, it's basically upland. And we don't use the term mountain very much here in South Western Australia. But the little peaks uh, and the top slide there, the flat top mazes, the, their summits are Ockbills, uh, but the slopes on, that are eroding away from them are, are Yodfuls. They're right beside each other. So you get different plants on those slopes from ones that occur on the top. And then as you go down the valley, uh, towards uh, river systems or the ocean, you have transitional country between really old and really young, and you hit the edge of the wetlands, and that's where you get the young and fertile stuff. So original farmers here, of course, went for the young and fertile stuff, and these hilltops, the granite outcrops, the high sand plains of southwestern Australia were regarded as worthless country and left uh, uh, largely uncleared until superphosphate and trace element enrichment was discovered. There are a number of ideas that are coming out of Ockbill theory, and if you're interested in it, uh, it's in the paper I, I cited. I just want to emphasise a couple, and the very first one is just the notion that if, if landscapes have existed in general form for tens of millions of years and been climatically buffered, um, there's an opportunity for plants, animals, and, and indeed human cultures to persist for very long periods of time if they can evolve ways of coping with the infertility and, uh, and other things. So I, I just want to focus on, on that idea and give you an example of how we're beginning to test that idea and how you can test it these days is look at the fossil record of animals and plants but also look at DNA sequencing and work out who's related to who and apply um, a molecular clock uh, to work out the relative age of things. And the more we look, the more we're finding in these old parts of the earth. So here's a honey possum, a southwest Australian endemic marsupial from a lineage that's 40 million years old. Um, it's the only non-flying mammal that feeds only on nectar and pollen in the world, and it's feeding on a, on a plant whose ancestors go back 120 million years in this landscape. And these things are flowering their heads off in the national parks right here in Albany at the moment. <clears throat> um, among the invertebrates, we're just beginning to explore this, and this is just one example of a biting midge, um, which uh, was widespread across the world. There's a fossil uh, upper left, uh, there from Lebanese amber that's about 100 million years old uh, and the thing biting uh, the reluctant uh, uh, girlfriend of the researcher here, um, midge bait, um, is, a, is this living midge that's almost identical with that fossil and it's only found these days in southwestern Australia. So extinction rates have been reduced and this thing has persisted only here even though it was as far afield as Lebanon in the past. <clears throat> the other thing about this comparison between ancient landscapes and young landscapes, and this begins to get into the, the application of, of this idea, is that there are special vulnerabilities and special resiliences that occur with old landscapes. The vulnerabilities come from the soil sitting intact for tens of millions of years. Everything in our soil in Bankshire woodlands or on these old landscapes, uh, uh, in the heathlands that we have, the Quonkin vegetation, everything to regenerate the native plant communities is in the top five to 10 centimetres of soil. If you strip that away, you've got to physically put the propagules back into the landscape to regenerate the community. If you leave it alone and don't mess with it, the, the community will regenerate. Compare that with uh, what happens in young landscapes worldwide. You know, in, in England, if you abandon a farm paddock, uh, within a, a year you've got oak seedlings and bramble seedlings and whatever popping up right in the middle. Within 10 years you've got a thicket, if not a woodland, and within 20 years you've got a, a regenerated forest with not a single human intervention occurring other than stopping the farming practice of, of regular um, ploughing. Do the same in the wheat belt here, um, and apart from a few hardy perennial native plants, uh, all the orchids, all the little shrubs, uh, they, they simply won't come back uh, for centuries. 
So it's a fundamentally different, different system to where most of our knowledge about how to practice agriculture and indeed how to live as a Western culture uh, has come from. Uh, weed invasion is another special vulnerability and here we have also uh, the greatest pandemic of plant disease occurring on the planet, uh, dieback disease, which there's 8,000 species of native plants in the southwest and 3,000 of those are susceptible to this introduced fungal pathogen. Uh, the discovery of the, uh, the fact that threatened species are also concentrated in these old landscapes came out of work that I and colleagues did and published many years ago. And we just looked at the, the most threatened plant species in the southwest of WA, in WA and found that 64% of them were on these old upland mesas, granite outcrops, sand plains. About 25% were on the intervening country and only 10% or so, 11%, were in the fertile uh, bits. So in terms of threatened species management, this is good news for farmers because uh, you know, the fertile stuff um, uh, by and large has far fewer threatened species to deal with than the stuff that most, most farmers keep just for bushland retention or uh, uh, a land that's not really ideal for, for, for agriculture. And globally, as we start to look at where are the concentrations of threatened animals and plants um, that are found nowhere else uh, but the region in which you see them. And this map just illustrates that point. It's, uh, it's the global biodiversity hotspots, they're called, circled in red, uh, where global biodiversity hotspots coincide with regions rich in oakbills. And in, in Australia, we've got two. We've got Southwest Australia as one of these global biodiversity hotspots and the forests of East Australia. So what might you do to care for these sort of places? Um, leaving them alone, providing space, uh, fundamental, and they can be quite small areas of land, unlike what you may have heard and learned about, you know, only big reserves are worth keeping is one idea that comes from people who study young, fertile landscapes. Small reserves are, are just as valuable on old landscapes. Not bulldozing, leaving the soil alone. So when you, for fire management, for example, the great innovation that's occurred here in southwestern Australia is slashed fire breaks uh, instead of bulldozed fire breaks. That's had all sorts of major advantages for soil management as well as biodiversity management. Um, climate change is something that these, these sort of organisms on these old landscapes have persisted through tremendous climate change over tens of millions of years. Um, and how we handle them then in terms of forecast climate change, I suggest is fundamentally different from some of the ideas that have been promulgated um, worldwide based on people who study young, fertile landscape organisms. Uh, invasion biology, uh, the, that's uh, weeds and feral animals are important and I, I would suggest that things like replanted corridors are in fact something you wouldn't do for old landscapes but you would do for young landscapes. And it basically it's about minimising human disturbance. How we manage fire is another thing. So here in Albany, just to uh, wind up, we've got a Great group of postgrad students now who are working with me on testing some of these ideas. Um, and the sort of topics we're working on are illustrated in this rather complex slide, but it, everything from uh, uh, pollination ecology, uh, looking at animals and plants that pollinate our tremendous flowers, the Albany pitcher plant, uh, looking at dieback disease, looking at the correlation between geodiversity and biodiversity, <coughs> and the last. Uh, point I just want to mention, it re relates to the collaborative work with Aboriginal people. Uh, I do want to signal that our own species, you and me, our ancestors, uh, evidence increasingly is point pointing to the south coast of South Africa as to where we evolved in a very small population in an Ockville region. So the relevance of some of your attributes and mine may not be understood until we start studying from an Ockville perspective. Um, <coughs> So just three little slides to illustrate uh, examples here. This is about species richness in plants where red is shown uh, as the richest areas in southwestern Australia. Uh, globally, it's a plateau of species richness that's extraordinary. And the point of this slide is just to emphasize that our cities and our regional areas right across the southwest are as rich as the richest places on earth, as rich in uh, plants as Rio or Sydney uh, or Cape Town. Sydney itself, uh, handling Ockbills, the, the Blue Mountains behind Sydney, 
haven't been uh, cleared extensively. Where they chose to put the Warragamba Dam um, was fortuitous, um, but uninformed by the line of thinking I've been talking about. But we now have a World Heritage Area that is classic Ockville and uh, is celebrated as a major tourism attraction. And Albany has the same. These granite outcrops just outside, uh, right in the heart of the city, are Ockbills. Um, Albany is, is blessed, as Tim Winton indicated, with this tremendous opportunity for discovery and uh, celebration and new ways of thinking. So I'd conclude, ladies and gentlemen, by saying that we do have this inheritance. It's, a, it's a, perhaps a new idea and a new approach to considering landscape. But uh, right across Australia, there are places like this, rich in endemic species. Many of your uh, regions you represent, I'm sure, uh, would have them. We need friends of organisations to start caring for and appreciating these places in novel ways. Uh, we need to collaborate with Aboriginal people, and I would suggest one way uh, and one very penetrating idea that Aboriginal culture uh, developed, cultures developed, is totems. And I suggest each of us having an animal and a plant totem is a fundamental transition in mainstream society that would do wonders. And lastly, uh, World Heritage has been accorded to places like Sydney, Ockbills, South African Ockbills. The Kwonkan uh, and other Ockbills in southwestern Australia deserve World Heritage listing and there's a small group of us just embarking on that journey uh, to see if that can be achieved. Thank you.